Welcome to the Selling to Corporate podcast, where we're going to be challenging your sales beliefs around selling to corporate organizations and help you increase your bottom line profits every single month. I am Jessica Lorimer, your sales expert and guide in this world of selling to corporate companies, skyrocketing your company sales and making the impact that you really want in the world. Now, don't forget, if you do enjoy the show today, please do head over to iTunes and leave us a review. But enjoy this episode, and I am really looking forward to sharing some epic sales wisdom with you. Hey, 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 it is the end of October and I'm coming to you with some very exciting news. That's right, this episode airs on the 27th of October and what is special about that? Well, absolutely nothing except that it's a few days before Halloween and, you know, I like sweets and fancy dress so there's always an opportunity that I might be uh, (laughs) parading around the internet in some kind of costume. But more importantly, it does mean that there's only a couple of weeks until my first live masterclass of this year and I know that you're probably thinking how is it November and you're just doing the first live masterclass of this year and I'm going to tell you dear listener I've been busy (laughs) and that is the simple fact of it but if you are somebody who is interested in learning how to make your first 100k in b2b sales and I mean any currency because you know I thought about putting in pounds because I'm in the UK and then I thought, well, no, we've got loads of people in the US who listen. And then I thought about what all about all these people in Central Europe and, you know, in the Asia Pacific region and the Middle East. So I thought, well, instead of me trying to break it down into every single currency on earth, I'm going to make it easy for myself. (laughs) So if you're interested in how to make your first 100,000 in any currency of B2B sales, make sure you head to the show notes. Right at the top, there is a link that you can click. It will take you to the registration page and you can sign up for the live masterclass. Now, I know some people do masterclasses. They're not very good. Let's throw that out the window right now. I have no beef with, (laughs) no beef, how cool am I? Um, I have no beef with any of those people that do masterclasses that aren't very good. And then, you know, they just kind of head off into the ether. But I prefer not to do that. And that's why I do so few live masterclasses. So if you do decide to register for the masterclass, it is being held on Thursday, the 9th of November, be held at 1pm UK. And we're going to be talking about the main elements that you need to have set up in your sales process to generate your first 100k of B2B sales. I'm going to be talking about some of the things that can really make you fall into feast or famine mode, instead of being able to focus on your revenue goals and actually hit your first 100k in B2B sales without feeling overwhelmed, overworked and slightly like you have created a monster. And we're also going to be talking about how you can money map your market as well. So I'm going to be sharing some of the results from the recent pieces of research that we've done, which is going to be exciting. The very first time I'll have published them anywhere. And of course, there will be a live Q&A at the end as well. So if you want to ask me questions about your specific business and how you can make 100K in it, then that is a good time, as any, (laughs) to ask away. So do make sure that you head over to the show notes. Like I say, they're right at the top. I like to make your life easy. And yeah, I think you should come. Also, sharing is caring. So if you get a lot out of the podcast and you think, yeah, I'm going to sign up to the masterclass because it sounds like an absolute hoot and useful then please do share it with any friends, peers or colleagues that you know who it might also benefit because I have this amazing thing on the internet where I seem to be the best kept secret and people are like, I've never heard of you. And then they find me through, I don't know, magical mystery tours of Google. But actually it's it's probably easier if their friends just say, hey, there's a, a good podcast, you should give it a listen. Or here's a school masterclass, have a whirl. But yeah, in all seriousness, if you do know people that benefit, please do send them the registration link because that would be really helpful to them and it makes you a really good human being and gives me all the warm and fuzzies as well. So with all that being said, I want to have a little chat today about some myths about working and selling to corporate companies because over the last four years 
and it is four years in November that I will have been um, actively selling the C-suite, going to have a little birthday party. Um, but over the last four years, or well, four and a half years since I set up selling to corporate, I've heard lots of people give me reasons about that they genuinely believe, let's just throw that out there, that they genuinely believe uh, reasons that they shouldn't be selling to corporate companies. Or, and this is more uncomfortable, ways that they justify to themselves that corporate companies are just not buying and therefore their sales process is not working. So buckle in because it's going to be an interesting ride. And I want to talk about the five major myths that I hear. We're going to talk about it nice and objectively. And just understand some of the things that are actually true, why they might be true, and some of the things that are completely false. Because as with everything, there's no, I don't know, smoke without fire, right? Some of these myths haven't, they haven't just popped up because people thought, oh, that'll be a laugh. <laughs> Let's spread this rumor on the internet. Some of these things have grains of truth in them. And so I want to discuss it in a really objective way so that you know where you are actually making accurate predictions and assumptions and where you might be doing yourself a bit of a disservice with your B2B sales process. Okay, so let's dig in. There are five myths. Obviously, I'll do a nice little summary at the end, probably, if I remember. And let's just see what is actually happening. So when we're talking about these five myths, these are just the top ones that I've identified. These are the ones that I see most commonly in my inbox. These are the ones that I see baby business coaches all over the internet telling people as reasons that they shouldn't sell to corporate organizations. Like I say, some of them have grains of truth and that's what we're here to look at today is what are the pieces or assumptions that have elements of truth and what are the things that are just doing us a disservice. But I do also think it's important to look at why. Why these myths are so prevalent and where are we doing ourselves a disservice particularly now. So if we start looking at the economy, for example, over the last two years on the podcast, I've been banging on about the economy. I know it's really boring. I don't particularly love <laughs> talking about the economy worldwide. And I really don't love talking about it in the UK. But we've seen some changes to the economy. And particularly post-COVID, those changes have been roller coasters you know, around the world, and they've had huge impacts. The economy of one country has really, really gone on to impact and potentially damage or positively impact economies in other areas. That doesn't make it an easy place to operate. We've also had humanitarian crises and war that have meant that the cost of living has been pushed up significantly. So for those of you who are selling B2C, business to consumer, you might have noticed that buying patterns have changed in your area. One of the things that I've seen probably over the last, I don't know, three to six months is that people in the Facebook newsfeed have become really panicked about this change in the way that consumers are buying. So, you know, people that used to be doing huge launches and things are now commenting on the fact that people aren't buying in the same way or they're putting out multiple offers all the time selling lots and lots of different things and you know they're they're lowering their price points these are all indicators of what we already know that the average consumer has changed the way that they are spending their disposable income and rightly so you know 85% of my audience give or take are parents Side note, that that always surprises me because I obviously am not a parent and I try my best to be parent friendly, but I don't know a lot about children. So <laughs> for those of you who are parents, thanks for sticking with me. I appreciate it. And, and thank you for <laughs> tolerating my advice, which I try my best to think outside the box with. But we, we are seeing that those people, people who have to prioritize children, other family members who have other commitments, Absolutely. Their disposable income is not just theirs, right? They, they have those priorities and commitments that they need to allocate resource and finances to. Which means that the B2C market has changed. 
you know, and it's not just in the online space that it's changed, you know, supermarkets are reporting changes in the way that people are buying and what people are buying. We're seeing retailers look at how people are purchasing or making decisions around what they purchase. We're seeing it everywhere, you know, but it's interesting because a year ago, people were reaching out to me and telling me that I was, I was negative because I was saying, Hey, look, you know, that it is going to change. We've got this economy changing significantly what's going to happen with consumers because they're not going to have the same amount of disposable income and people are like oh Jess you just have the wrong mindset okay well you know here we are and I think we have to now acknowledge that those changes are happening interestingly enough we're now seeing lots of people who are thinking well I should switch across to b2b because like I've been banging the drum for ages, I realise that this sounds like I'm saying I told you so a lot. I'm really not. <laughs> my personal judgments are reserved only for my husband, my dog, and I don't know, maybe like five of my friends. <laughs> They're the only people that I will ever say I told you so to because they have to put up with me. <laughs> but we are seeing this rise in people thinking, well, actually, no, I, I should be selling to corporate organisations, not least because you know, this this crazy British woman on the internet is, is saying that I should, but also because of the facts. You know, the average corporate sale is worth five times as much as the average B2C sale. And, you know, the lifetime customer value um, is much higher from a B2B client versus a B2C client. So we're seeing lots of people who are starting to challenge that perception of actually did I really want to become an influencer do I really want to have to show up on social media every day do I really want to have to do all of the things that it requires for me to have this large b2c presence and overwhelmingly the answer is becoming no because people are tired because people don't want to have to show up on social media all the time because people feel overwhelmed post pandemic post everything else that's been going on, you know, 2023 for a lot of people has been a real challenge emotionally, physically with their businesses. And so people are looking for the simple ways to make their business work and operate in a way that works for them. As a society, we've moved vastly away from overwhelm and hustle culture and staying up until 2am to run a launch because it looks great on social like you're, you're putting the reps in eh, I like sleep you know I'm lazy we talk about that a lot right so I just want to in today's episode talk through some of the myths that we might think are keeping us safe or that we might have previously believed because the common rhetoric was that you know, big companies were going to be difficult to work with, that they wouldn't buy from smaller suppliers, that it's going to be a nightmare to price things. Because they worked for the people who were peddling that narrative, right? Just buy another course on Instagram, just buy another course on insert social media platform here. I don't hate Instagram, by the way, I just don't understand it. And now we're in a world where it's difficult to do that and so we need to consider other options so let's have a look at what the myths are and see which bits are reality and which bits are not so much the first myth is that and I hear this a lot and it would be totally normal for you to think and believe this but is that corporate companies take ages to pay if you're nodding already <laughs> I see you <laughs> look I don't know I don't entirely know where this myth came from, but if I had to take a guess, an educated guess, I would imagine that it came from the days of, I don't know, pre-2010, where companies had very extensive payment terms. And a lot of the times, organizations, particularly really big name brands, would have payment terms that were just ridiculous. They were like, oh, we're going to we're going to have net 90 or even net 120 in some cases, meaning six months after you invoice or six months after you deliver, we're going to pay you. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Now, interestingly enough, one of the things that 
governments realized and policymakers realized and I think the financial services uh, industry as a whole realized is that when you give such long payment terms it has a really significant impact on cash flow and when you significantly impact cash flow that causes a whole host of other issues right so if one company has really long payment terms and they pay another company whether that company is big or small on those payment terms that other business has to somehow manage all of their operational expenses without getting paid potentially for months now obviously we all have seen financial crises <laughs> around the world none of them pleasant and funnily enough organizations realized that those extensive payment terms actually weren't working as well as they could because some organizations during financially challenging periods were like well we're actually at risk of going bust because we just don't have cash flow like we've delivered things we have paid our people to deliver things we're keeping our lights on we're doing all this stuff but we haven't been paid yet for work that's already done dangerous yeah now that's one of the major reasons that companies started to change payment terms they started realizing that actually there was a, a high level of risk and I'm not saying that there are not companies out there who don't work still to those extended payment terms. But I am saying it's less and less likely these days, right? That they are mandating that they're going to pay you six months after you've actually delivered something. It's also a very high risk strategy. I don't work with clients that pay me six months after I've delivered something. That's, <laughs> I've delivered it. I've done my bit. I want to get paid, right? And companies have been working you know, around the world with governments to actually change payment terms. In the UK, there is actually a voluntary register of organisations who say that if they're working with small businesses, they commit to having a specific payment term or a specific set of payment terms to get them paid earlier, right? To make sure that they have cash flow. And that's because Governments around the world have recognized that people who decide to run and operate small businesses, A, need to get paid, and B, are going to be a big part of the economy. So it makes sense for them to get paid quickly and simply. It is not the norm now for companies to take ages to pay you. You know, I have worked with people for the last four years solely on B2B sales in the entrepreneur world. And before that, I was working with people in the entrepreneur world to sell to corporates. It just wasn't my primary offering. And so over the last almost 10 years, I've seen thousands of entrepreneurs sell to corporates. And do you know what I haven't seen? Any that have been held to 120-day payment terms or 90-day payment terms. In fact, most of my clients actually get paid before they deliver work before they deliver work and I think that's really important because there's a big difference between taking a risk in you know creating a big piece of work for a company and not being paid and you know spending all that time creating it and secretly in the back of your head worrying like oh god what if they decide they don't want it will they still pay me how will that work and being paid beforehand so you're like oh well I've been paid, I'm going to make the time my diary, let's make this happen. Companies recognise that this is a quid pro quo situation. If they pay you, you're much more likely to get started straight away with the work, have all of the time bookmarked in your calendar, nothing's going to mess that up. If they haven't paid you, there is always a risk that you could find a client who wants to pay you in full immediately for something and you have to push their work back because they aren't a priority. I'm also not saying that's what you should do or that's what you should ever communicate to a client, but there's a risk there, right? It's not a one-way risk anymore. Now, the other thing is, let's just talk about this on a B2C, B2B level. When we talk about clients taking ages to pay, there's always this um, argument that people put forward to me. They're like, yeah, but individuals, like you can get them on a payment plan and like they pay you and it's, it's all great. And I'm like, yeah, that's nice because I've never had a corporate company that has waltzed out of paying me but I've had loads of entrepreneurs who've tried so let that settle in because I am not slating any entrepreneurs on the internet 
things happen, life happens, things don't always turn out in the way that you expect. But what I will say is that there are people out there, and I see this across particularly the bigger launch programs out there, where people just stop paying. Like they'll just stop their payment plans. They'll cancel things. They'll, you know, for no reason really, other than sometimes they want to buy a different program and they just don't fancy having two payments in place. I've never had that from a company. My clients have never had that from a company where they've just gone, yeah, we just don't fancy paying you. In fact, I've had clients who have had, you know, who've delivered keynote talks, for example, where they had let the client record them and the client's been like, oh God, our tech has failed and the recording hasn't happened. Can we pay you again to record the talk? Can you imagine that? Having a client that's like, can we pay you again because we screwed up? That doesn't happen often on the B2C side of things. So when you're thinking to yourself or when you're hearing, oh, corporates take ages to pay, maybe some of them will take a bit longer than your average you know, B2C payment plan, depending on how you are setting out your payment terms and what you are agreeing to, but they will pay. Whereas there are, you know, there's key evidence to support that in the B2C world, some of the major launches that happen and some of the people who run the biggest programs will actively publish their statistics around refunds and around non-payment. And those people end up in small claims courts, they end up in legal situations, and it's really difficult, right? 10 years, I've been selling to companies, I've never had one not pay. Yeah, so just think about it. The myth is completely or was completely real. Nowadays, it's very much driven by you, your boundaries, your payment terms, what you're willing to sign up for and what you're not. And I think we need to make that a more reasonable adjustment. So it's not that companies take ages to pay. It's that your job is to set the right boundaries with companies around your payment terms and what's going to work for you whether that's key deliverables based, whether it's getting paid in full before something happens, whether it's at schedule points during the the commitment, whatever. But it's driven by you. You have some control over it, all right? Now, the second myth that I hear quite a lot is that it'll take corporates ages to buy from you. (laughs) Um, And again, like, this is not something that I have experienced. And it's not something that my clients typically experience. But let's talk about it from both perspectives. One, it can take corporates a while to buy, depending on what you're selling. And most often, if people are selling only complex and premium services. So let's say your specialism is in rolling out implementations of tech change projects. They're usually quite big. They usually involve a lot of moving parts, not least trying to find out how much the software is going to cost. And so that actual scoping and sales process can take a while because the project is just large. It's usually multi-phased. It's usually a multi-six-figure deal in the end. And it just takes time to get everybody to talk to each other. Those deals absolutely can take time. The reason that people spend the time on them is, like I mentioned, they're usually multi-six-figure deals. They usually are very lucrative and, and worth the effort. For the average person selling at sort of 50K and below in terms of deal size, actually corporates like to buy quite quickly. And the reason that they like to buy quite quickly is because they want the result that they've been promised. Yeah. And they recognize if they sign up, they're going to get started. So the maximum time that I see clients spending on deals under 50k is around three months that's the maximum the longest time I've seen clients spend on deals you know can be around six months and and to be clear this is when we talk about the time they're spending on a deal this is about the time they go from initial business development call to actually having the contract signed money in the bank as opposed to the time that they generated the lead and and whatever So for most people, once they go from business development call, they're looking at about a month's turnaround. 
to actually get a decision made. For people who don't have a clear sales process in place, it can take longer, particularly if your diagnostic skills aren't great on the sales call, and particularly if your process for following up isn't good. And, you know, also factors around your proposal writing, how you're articulating a solution, how you're designing a solution and making it sellable. But the reality is that it doesn't take corporate companies ages to buy. It does, however, take people who are not practicing, honing and tweaking their sales skills a lot longer to sell. And that's because when we look at the, the stages of the sales process, most people you know, they're, they're not getting complete clarity on what kind of industry they want to work with. They're not generating the right leads, meaning qualified leads who are actually responsible for their area of specialism and have budget to pay them. They might not be navigating sales calls in the best way and not necessarily getting all the information they need to create the right solution or present it correctly in a proposal. There are lots of other factors that go into the, the speed at which you can create a sale than you know the things that we normally blame pricing being too high <laughs> you know or our negotiation skills not being great people often blame those things but it's very rarely those it's about your overall sales process which parts are you managing which parts are you taking ownership and accountability for which parts are you doing really well and which parts are you not okay the third myth is that corporate companies do things as a tick box exercise this is one that I particularly hear in the health and wellness space. Again, completely normal to think it. You will definitely have some companies that will go as far as telling you <laughs> we're doing this as a tick box exercise because we have to, right? So we see this most commonly in health and wellness, and we also see it commonly in the DEI space as a feeling, not as fact necessarily, okay? And I think that's really, really a big distinction to make. Does it mean that it has always been this way? No. Health and wellness and DEI are relatively new spaces in the corporate sphere, meaning you know they, they haven't always been traditional business areas. They are relatively new in terms of being highly prioritized, mostly since the pandemic, um, if we're honest. And so before that, some initiatives that were health and wellness based or DEI based were seen as tick box exercises. So they'd be like, oh, yeah, um, awareness days. Let's take International Women's Day, for example. They're like, yeah, sure. We have to do something about International Women's Day because, you know, we just have to. Companies weren't necessarily thinking long term about, OK, well, what happens after International Women's Day? How do we keep this initiative rolling? How do we continually prioritize women in the workplace? How do we continually make sure that they're supported, promoted, that they feel valued, that they're able to showcase their skills? that we are being good allies. Most companies are just like, ah, oh, no, screw it. Like, it's an awareness day. Like, let's just share some inspirational stories, tell women they're great. And that's enough, right? They've, they've had their day in March. Let it go. Obviously, and I just want to clarify, that was an example. It's not something I necessarily believe at all. Um, but we, we've all been there, right? We've, we've heard companies and as employees, all of us have worked for a company at some point or another that has gone, oh, we just have to do it. They're not fully bought in to actually doing it well. They're not fully bought into continuing an, initi an initiative. And it doesn't feel great, right? It makes it feel like a tick box exercise that they just do to look good in the market as opposed to do because they want to prioritize and support. That has massively changed. And, you know, this is probably the, the myth or the biggest myth that has the most basis, or the most factual basis, because it is something we've, most of us have experienced working with those companies who, like I say, don't buy in to initiatives. But it has also been the biggest area that companies have changed, particularly post-COVID. Companies realised massively during the pandemic that well-being was a huge thing for employees. Mental, emotional, physical, financial well-being all a huge priority. Diversity was also massively spotlighted. So diversity, equity and inclusion as an area hugely spot or hugely thrown into the spotlight because of things that happened both during and post pandemic. 
these areas are high growth areas. And organizations now really are embracing the fact that if done well, areas like DEI and health and well-being can bring huge returns on investment in terms of company culture, team culture, performance, reduced sickness-related absence, reduced stress-related absence, reduced burnout, the continuance of knowledge and expertise, the reduced attrition rates that we see. Like There are hundreds of reasons, that, hundreds of tangible reasons that companies are now thinking, hmm, these are not tick box areas. We need to prioritize them. We need to continue these initiatives and make them really good. Yeah. So don't get caught up in thinking, oh, it's just a tick box exercise. And that's why they only want to pay a little bit for it or, or whatever. Actually start thinking when you're going for these opportunities, am I making it business critical? Because nine times out of 10, when providers come to me and they say, oh, but they only want to pay me 200 pounds for lunch and learn session. I'm like, hmm, interesting. And I'll ask, okay, can you share what the main transformation is for me? And they'll go, oh, employees will be happy and healthy. I'm like, okay, where's the business case? Where's the commercially critical reason that an organization should do that? I mean, yeah, employees being happy and healthy is nice, but it's not specific. It's not measurable. It's not commercially critical. You're not saying if employees, you know, are supported to prevent burnout, the organization will see a significant decrease in recruitment costs, in attrition and in sickness related absence. That is commercially critical. Being happy and healthy is nice to have. Meaning they're not going to spend premium prices on it, right? So your messaging and the way that you articulate your products, your services is integral for companies to be able to see it as a commercially critical incentive or must have rather than a nice to have, chuck a couple of hundred quid at it, see what happens. It is not them that's seeing it as a tick box exercise. Now it's about the way that suppliers are communicating it. And often it is us that is making it or presenting it as not being commercially critical. And that is why we're seeing lack of engagement, lower prices, et cetera. All right. Fourth myth. They only buy from big companies. Nah. I can't do the noise. <laughs> you know, like game shows in the 90s, I was like, uh -uh. I need to really work on that. When I was working in corporate, someone actually used to have this, a sales manager, used to have a little buzzer on their desk that they'd press. And when they thought one of their salespeople were doing the wrong thing, they would press it and everyone would know, <laughs> which was humiliating. And <laughs> yet again, a reason that sales gets a really bad rap. But I did an episode on this recently about why companies actually prefer buying from smaller suppliers. So if you want a more in-depth understanding of why this myth is now not true, please do go and check out that episode because I'm not going to wax on and on about it here um, when I've already spent 30 minutes boring you. Well, not boring you because I know that you'd be really interested in it, but talking about it in depth there. Simply put though, smaller suppliers are more agile. They are more likely to actually delivering expertise and value for the price that they charge. It is not that smaller suppliers cost less. It is not that smaller suppliers are easier to manipulate. It is not that, you know, they, they kind of fancy taking on a small supplier to do a good thing. They actually and actively appreciate the work, expertise and value that smaller suppliers can offer. So it is a complete myth that they will only buy from big organizations. We are seeing lots and lots of shifts the other way. Um, so do check out that episode if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about it. And then finally, the final myth is that corporate companies always want to pay the least amount possible. And this isn't true at all, right? This, I think, has the least factual root. One of the things that's always interesting to me is that when we feel underconfident in our sales strategy, we look for reasons that give us reassurance that the things we're doing are right, even when they're not. And that sucks because we look for the narratives that make us feel comfortable and good rather than the narratives that point out where we might be able to grow and learn. 
as somebody who spent most of my early 20s feeling quite triggered by people who were really successful salespeople and striving to beat them at every opportunity, I would say that there are healthier ways of approaching this than others. And it's one of the things that actually I learned in my late 20s to understand that not everything that was triggering or uncomfortable for me was actually something that I should be angry about. It was something that I should use as an experience to learn and grow. So I'm delivering this last one with, I don't know, a velvet glove, right? The bad rap that corporate companies get for always wanting to pay the least possible for any kind of service, I think is unfair. Corporate companies historically have been open to negotiation and rightly so, because most corporate organizations tend to buy at volume. They will go on and do extra work with suppliers. They will be used to in their everyday business life, making decisions based on volume, making decisions based on successful negotiations. And they will also be really practiced at negotiating because it is something that happens day to day in the corporate experience. However, what a lot of entrepreneurs have translated this to is that corporates always want to beat us down on price or corporates always want to pay the least possible or corporates don't value what I'm putting out there. And sometimes what we fail to look at is, am I actively negotiating with corporate organizations? Am I pricing my services at a level where I would be happy to negotiate and give myself a buffer from negotiation? Am I actively communicating and articulating the value that I am adding to a corporate organization? And am I making it a commercially critical purchase for them? A lot of the time we're not. Because the other myths that we've heard today play into it. We go, oh, they just see it as a tick box exercise. Oh, they're, they're talking to loads of competitors. So I know I'll charge the least or the, the lowest price and they'll probably buy from me. We assume that they want to buy solely based on price and not at all based on quality. And I think that's really odd because when we sell B2C versus B2B, people are forever telling like individual consumers that they need to be buying the best experience, the best quality, the thing that's going to be right for them. We make the assumption that they will want to buy a quality service. But with B2B, we almost remove that. We're like, oh, well, they only want to pay the least possible. No, they're only interested in the price. That's kind of an unfair assumption to make, right? What we should actually be educating our prospective corporate clients on is, okay, well, here's how this is commercially critical for you. Here are the consequences that will happen if you don't decide to go down this route. I understand that you have this budget in place, but and then here's what you can get for that. But if you spend X amount more, here's the additional value and transformation that you could achieve. We don't do it because we're not used to having negotiation conversations. And because sometimes if we're honest, we're so, we just want the sale so much that we forget the sales process behind it. So this is a huge myth. Corporates don't just want to pay the least possible. That's why they, they tend to end up paying a lot more for solutions. It's why they will do things multiple times. They'll actually buy multiple solutions to solve a problem because sometimes the first time they'll buy the wrong thing. They'll go with the person who charged the least and you know they'll get an experience that they didn't want. So they'll have to buy again and again and again to get the right thing. And that's why it's important that actually your sales process is on point. Your diagnostic skills are on point. You are confident and competent in business development calls to educate clients, to challenge their perceptions, to actively talk them through the difference between taking option one and taking option two. That you're articulating your solutions in a way that presents them as a viable business case. It's about your sales process. It's not about them. You know, yeah, okay, there'll always be the old company who's just like, We've got this left in the budget. We need it to match. You'll get the old company who's like, we just don't care about this area, but we have to be seen to be doing something. You'll get the old company who's like, oh, I just, we, we wanted to make this decision six months ago. And we still haven't. 
but they're the minorities. These myths are the companies who are in the minority, not the majority anymore. Okay. Now, obviously, if you're in the C-suite, you know that there are templates galore to help with this. There is support galore to help with business development calls, exact questions and questioning techniques that you can use to make sure you get all the right information, that you're diagnosing things correctly, crib sheets that you can use on calls to keep you in the right direction, offer creation, workbooks, templates, offer types, price benchmarking, proposal templates, and the lot. And if you're not in the C-suite, maybe now is the time to start considering it, okay? But before all that, obviously, there is the free webinar on, or free masterclass, sorry, on November the 9th. It is live with me. We'll be talking about how you can get your first 100K of B2B sales. Make sure that you go to the show notes right at the top and get yourself signed up. And I will see you on Thursday, the 9th of November.